Вот теперь мотор. So topic of uh, today's talk would be quantum, potentially quantum gravity on uh, Grothendieck schemes as an alternative uh, approach to quantum gravity, okay? So the plan would be the following. Okay, so first I'll recall gravity from bosonic string. And uh, I will also mention so-called Polyakov conjecture. Then I'll describe the problem of what would be, uh, so before I go there, uh, I will describe the recall. The, instant first order formalism in sigma models and also point number three would be would be what would be deformations uh, then what I'll call Polyakov geometry. And beta function. Point number four. Example. Point number five, string Einstein equation as homotopical mauer cartan equation. Point number six, e Gravity on schemes. And here the very important example is gravity on zero dimensional schemes. And the point numbers, uh, and that's why the point number six in this program. <coughs> would be the proposal to have a theory of gravity with the finite dimensional. That's what, I, that's what I like most. With finite dimensional space fields. So here we will have gravity, we may say quantum gravity, 
but here there will be no ultraviolet divergences. And actually, it is kind of a new or conjecturally new uh, gravity coming from strings. And uh, if I'll have time, I will say that uh, conjecture on appearance of lattices. But it is kind of a weak conjecture, it's not well done. So I'm not sure that I'll explain this. However, <coughs> this, is, this is kind of a new dimension in string approach to gravity. Okay? So this is the plan. So, so let me start. I'm sorry, I need to change the this thing. So let me start with some history. So as you know, string theory were discovered without respect to gravity. And the uh, interesting thing started only when in the year 1993, 1973, people discovered that uh, bosonic string, and there were only bosonic st strings at time, describe uh, graviton. And uh, since then, people were thinking uh, that if bosonic string describe uh, gravity, what kind of gravity it should be? And uh, after some thinking, there was a conjecture of Polyakov. Polyakov. He said that string theory implies gravity in the following form. <coughs> string theory has conformal field theory as a background. And uh, being CFT means that you are classical solution to gravity equation. And uh, people somehow confirmed it in the sigma model. So uh, people studied the model of this type. And they somehow convinced themselves that this is ask a response to conformal field theory if 
in the reading order, D is Rishi flat. So it is kind of a weak information of the, of the Polyakov conjecture. However, Polyakov conjecture was much stronger. Polyakov conjecture says that uh, this leading order in G naught square, that this statement is only the leading in G naught square statement. And uh, non perturbative statement should be, should look like, should look like this. We should study all conformal field theory. And this would be non perturbative in G naught square or in alpha prime. So sometimes people call it alpha prime. Non perturbative definition of what gravity is. Later, people uh, said, let us study general conformal field theory. And if we have general conformal field theories, the question is, do we have manifold and geometry? If we have general conformal field theory. And actually, mirror symmetry started It's a question of equation. So mirror symmetry started from the following observation. There were five super conformal field theories with a central charge equals three halves. And then people studied tensor product of them. And they were trying to find. People were naive, you know. What is a target space? Metric. And you know what? People got confused. Because you could either say that you could either say that you have the model like this, in C5 in CP4, so this is an equation of three-dimensional Calabi-Yau manifold. So we have five variables, homogeneous, so we speak about CP4, and here is, the, uh, here is this hypersurface. Or equivalently, it could be the orbifold of this model. So uh, I don't quite remember the group. So uh, definitely it was something like Z, maybe it was Z5 to the, to the fifth power. I don't exactly remember the power here. So this, this model had a symmetry. And the symmetry of this model was that you can multiply xi to the e to the 2 pi i over 5 xi. So I, I, I'm not sure that it was 5 here, but it was not that important. <clears throat> the important thing was that if, if it is an orbifold model, 
then it has it would have very different topology. And uh, the first model definitely had the Hodge number H11 equal to one, and it had H21 equal, I think, 101. So this H11 corresponded to Keller moduli. What dimensional space of Keller moduli? And here we have 100.1 the first space of deformation of complex structures. And you can write it, you can write them like this, x, x. So any polynomial of degree five. So there are many polynomials. And this was one model. At the same time, when you have an orbifold, you somehow fix the complex structure a lot. Because, uh, more, because you, can, you, you are not allowing most of these terms. So maybe here there are four, because the total uh, the total symmetry is in projective. So so you do not allow most of them, but uh, when you are taking an orbifold, uh, <coughs> you have singularity. You need to blow up the singularity. That's why you had something like h one one equal to one or h two. Oh, to 101 and h to one equal to one. <clears throat> and uh, these two things were simultaneously correct. Uh, so, I'm sorry. So then people realized that, that what does it mean that these two models are these two descriptions are simultaneously correct? It, it, it actually meant that, the, that imagine that there is a space of conformal field series. So it has Polyakov something, and then you are coming to the critical point, and here you have almost. Uh, almost zero dimensional field. Here. But you can also come here. And the space of this almost zero dimensional field fields observables is something that gives you the ring. Well, let me try to comment in which sense you have a ring. So typically in conformal field theory, you have fields, phi alpha, and then, and there is an operator product expansion. C alpha beta gamma phi gamma, and this depends on Z. And uh, there are some consistency conditions on this C alpha beta gamma on Z. They are kind of complicated. And, uh, and right now, people are trying to solve these consistency conditions, C alpha beta gamma on Z. Uh, they call it bootstrap equation, and uh, it's a complicated story. By the way, it worked in uh, many dimensions, not only in two. So recent, a recent work is to write down something like this in dimension three and four. And this is, it was called Polyakov bootstrap problem. However, just imagine that this happens in general theory, but let us suppose that uh, this theory has moduli M.
So M is the moduli of CFT. And then let us assume that when M goes to M critical, some fields I'll call these fields critical. M. Free critical beta Z of M have the structure constants that tend to, to what? Uh, sorry, not that they have this uh, structure constant, I'm sorry. Uh, so imagine that when M going to M critical, <coughs> conformal dimension of the critical, of some of the critical fields go to zero when M is going to M critical. Yes, it's like this. So delta is conformal dimension. So if you would like to ask me about the example, let me provide you an example. Example. Consider the model so-called Gaussian model of the radius R and there are fields I, K, Phi and conformal dimension of such field equals to K square over R square. And then we have an interesting limit, R going to infinity. So it's an example. Yes, in particular, conformal dimension of this field is one. <laughs> so it is not going to zero. As R going is going to infinity. So only special fields have uh, this dimensions and then on the general ground, then on the general ground, one can show that op operator product expansion of the critical fields C means critical. If I put here only critical fields, so when M going to M critical, then this thing is coming to the constant. So it becomes Z independent. And let us come to this example. It is an AK1 file. It is the AK25. Equal to what? It is the I K1 plus K25. And here we have so zero Z. So here we have moduli Z to what power? <coughs> As we know, it is K1 K2 divided by the R squared. So when R squared is going to plus infinity, this goes to constant. And we have just C structure constant that is 
C K1 K2 is delta K K1 plus K2. Okay. So this is an example. This is a general principle. And then <coughs> this critical fields, this OPE product of critical fields become becomes what? It becomes a ring. A commutative associative ring. And as we know that commutative associative ring corresponds to a scheme. Okay, so in this way, you are getting the geometry from conformal field theory. And if you have the modular space of conformal field theory, this modular space would correspond to two different geometries, several different geometries. Okay, so, so the idea of geometry of the target is not a fundamental object, it's an effective object. So geometry appears only in the weak coupling limit. Okay, and then the next question is, okay, geometry is here, but here by geometry, I mean the space. Some people by geometry mean the space equipped with the metric. So the question was, could we see the metric here? And the answer is, you know, yes, we can see the metric. In order to see the metric, we have to do the following. We consider this critical field, critical field, and we study the dimension of the grid. There is a notion of conformal dimension. We study the dimension of this field as M going to M critical. So of course it is zero at M equals M critical. So it is something like this. Tilde. So this is the mention of the field alpha. So we actually have this asymptotic thing. Now we understand this asymptotic thing as an eigenvalue of Laplacian in a merging metric. That emerges at this point. Here, here, in this example, one over R square is exactly M minus MC. And this chi square, this chi square, chi square is this delta tilde. It shows how uh, it shows the eigenvalues. So now we have a ring. And we have eigenvalues of what we would like to call the pleasure. And from this, we can read out metric, and we actually read out this metric as being a flat metric. So we have this example. Another example of this phenomena is WZW model. So we know this, the exact solution of WZW model. So 
let us see what we are looking for. We have a parameter there. So there is a group. And we are not changing the group. However, there is a level. Now let us see what happens when level goes to infinity. Let us see, we know that if you have a representation called R, then it corresponds to the field that has the following dimension. Quadratic Casimir in representation R divided by what? By K plus H star. So we see if we fix representation, okay, and tend K to infinity, then uh, the conformal dimension goes to zero. And is it, uh, uh, yes, is it is it obvious that you can reconstruct a metric from the spectrum of the Laplacian? Ah, it was the, it was the question in uh, mathematical physics one hundred and ten years ago, because at that moment people were thinking if uh, atoms were drums and they found that there was a discrete spectrum in atoms you know and there was a theory for several years that that this is explained because atoms are drums and there are resonant frequencies and that's what we see as a spectrum so you, as you know this theory failed but that time people uh, raised an issue can you hear the shape of a drum so you hear the drum you can you hear the shape and uh, i thought that it was a philosophical issue or you know just a slogan yes to hear the shape of, of a drum but uh, just recently, like one month ago, I was uh, watching uh, a talk on Langlands program. And uh, uh, so it was uh, one, and, one and a half year ago when there was a celebration of Langlands after Langlands got his Abel Fields Prize. Okay? And uh, not Abel Fields, Abel Prize. You see, Abel Price is the field price for an aged mathematician, you know. You cannot get a field price if you are uh, younger than 40. But if you are older than 40 and you are great, you are getting the Abel Price or Abel Price. Okay, and there were huge celebration and there were invited talks. And one of the person, on this celebration, mentioned this question. He explained <coughs> that piece of the Langlands program uh, is related to harmonic analysis, and harmonic analysis was exactly the issue: how to get the shape or the metric from the spectrum. And this uh, very respe respectful mathematician said to the wide audience that it is possible to hear it. So this is a problem that people studied and surprisingly the answer is yes. So uh, unfortunately, so uh, I didn't study this in detail, but I can say that very respectful mathematician on the very respectful celebration mentioned that the answer to hear the shape of the drum is yes. Okay? So I cannot say that I know that the answer is yes, but some very respectful people say that the answer is yes. Okay? Kolya, is this an honest answer to your question? Yeah, well, that's kind of a meta answer. I meant like more detailed, uh, like if there are any 
yes. the moduli uh, of the metric that cannot be captured by this moduli. I would also like to see more detailed, more constructive answer. So, but you see here, uh, here if you do this, uh, what you will definitely get is so-called while, uh, it's, it's a well-known uh, statement of, I think, while. So this is harmonic analysis on the group. On the group manifold. So in this way, you hear the Casimir as a metric. Okay. So I have this example. I have this example. Okay. And uh, of course, this is this. Uh, I would like to. I would like to have more examples. And there is also a statement that I have not checked. And the statement is that uh, this conformal dimension is actually that from, the, from this operator expansion near the critical point, you may deduce uh, that uh, you have the second order operator that computes the metric. So you may, you may try to see how conformal dimension is restricted when you have uh, Polyakov uh, bootstrap. Okay, so it's very intriguing thing and it's, it's not the topic of what I'm going to tell you, but while I'm going to the issue, I want to say that it's kind of interesting stuff. How to get it in the constructive way? How to get examples? So actually, I am interested in understanding this question. So uh, you see here, here, it is a group manifold. But uh, let me tell you what I have to study. So-called co-set models. Consider the group G over H. There are co-set theories. And we know that the energy momentum tensor is standard geomancy of answer of G minus that one of H. And you can compute these dimensions. So in this case, you can get probably not only the harmonic analysis on the group, but also harmonic analysis on homogeneous spaces. By the way, I am explaining it to you because once Kansevich took me by a button and told me, look, I want to tell you something. You see, he, he was in the good mood. And he explained to me this. Okay. And uh, he, considered, uh, he considered it as an interesting piece of knowledge. And I also consider it as an interesting piece of knowledge. Because this is a two-dimensional version of the well-known piece of knowledge. You see, this is in the world of two-dimensional conformal field theory. However, we knew the analog of this. In dimension one, instead of OPE due to Polyakov, we had operator algebra. We had a star product. I would like to say that we have A times B. OK. No, just multiplication. Uh, let me put it in the same language. C alpha beta gamma a gamma. And we also 
have uh, quantum field theories, sorry, now quantum mechanics, that depends on parameter M. And that's why we have this S alpha beta gamma that depends on M. And what we know, we know that when M is going to M critical, we have here what? We have commutative associative algebra. And then, if it is commutative at some m critical, then we can see well, then we can see what is going on near the m critical. Commutative, I will say it m critical plus m minus m critical. And here we have phi tilde, alpha, beta, gamma, plus something else. So, <coughs> so this is a ring, and this is what? This is a Poisson structure. Okay. So what I'm writing here is the classization so people mostly speak about quantization quantization means that you have a ring you have a poisson structure and you won't try to to go it from the right to the left i see it that this is this as an unnatural equation that natural equation is you take this and you go to the right. And in this way, in D equals to one, we have the ring and Poisson structure and we, and we call it uh, classical mechanics. And I would like you to see the similarity between D equals one and D equals two story. I'm showing you the similarity at the moment. I cannot explain why it's that natural, that Poisson structure that you have here. Okay, so you, you, you have also, you also have something here. Uh, how to get here the analog of this statement? You see the, uh, as it's a clear, there is a clear analogy between this and this. However, this analogy is not quite complete. Namely here, I don't see the Poisson structure. And here, I don't see this metric. Actually, I can say something about the right thing. You actually can see here Poisson structure. But in order to see Poisson structure here, you should consider not the operator product on the sphere, okay? Z0. So, Kolya, do you know where should one, how to see Poisson structure uh, in uh, two-dimensional conformal field theory? Hmm? Well, uh, uh, you mean look at the uh, vertex Poisson algebra? That's the classical limit of the. No, of course. Algebra. So, so I told you that for the sphere, you have this. On the sphere, you see the ring. Yeah. Commutative. And where can you see non commutativity? Well, in the, in the singular part of the OP. But it's not, yes, uh, you may, so you may say that let us consider this, Z, or what? So uh, let me tell you, okay? Because it's not obvious. And uh, 
of this is a sphere. However, you can, you can put it on a disk. So if you put this OPE on the disk, on the boundary of the disk, then, and if you go to the critical point, you may see that uh, in the limiting case, you are not having commutative C alpha beta gamma. But you you want to get kind of the one D here. You, you're trying to get the one D out of two D sort of. You see, my understanding here is not complete, but due to my that, but I think it's fair to share with you incomplete understanding. You see, but uh, I'm not speaking about crazy things. It's just me not uh, completed the, uh, the, uh, this. But if you do it like this, then you will get to associative, to constant associative structure. And here you will see non commutativity. On the boundary of the disk. And this, uh, this non commutativity is uh, Schwartz. Uh, Schwartz, I think. Now, oh, actually, it, it it comes it comes from the Carl Bramon field. So, if you have a Carl Bramon field, you see non commutativity. Okay. Well, um, but then, okay. Mm. The if you just look at the vertex algebra in the CFT, then by itself, without introducing boundary, it can be seen as a quantization of a vertex Poisson algebra with a singular part of the OP uh, interpreted as a non commutativity. So uh, maybe there are two non commutativities. But uh, the non commutativity that I see here is a Carl Bramon non commutativity. So, uh, and, and this non commutativity happens exactly as a critical point. Mm. You mean commutativity? So, this non commutativity. Yeah, I, I, I thought you mean commutativity happens at a critical point. But... No, here. So if uh, if points are on the boundary, you have non-commutativity at the critical point. <laughs> so if there are in the bulk, if there are in the bulk, then at the critical point you have commutativity. But if points are on the boundary. In the critical point, you have non commutativity. Well, okay, then well, what is the critical point? What are, so, so well, what is, so well, let me give you an example. Okay. The example of this model is, uh, once again, it's Moyal product. So, uh, so it actually happens uh, if you have a constant B field. So you have B field. And then you study fields on the boundary. And you compute uh, OP. So actually, when you compute this OPE, you have a B field, you have propagators, and you and you may convince yourself that you have non-commutative limit. But in the limit, you have non-commutative constant product. And uh, so the leading term was is uh, so for constant B field, it's called Moyle product. So for the small B field. 
It is just Poissonian structure. Uh, so, uh, if you ask me, well, what's the understand? what's the limit here again? In this what's example? the limit here? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, of course, the limit is alpha prime going to zero. Okay. And uh, you need to keep, you see, maybe you need to keep not the B field. So you, you keep the B field constant in terms of Poisson structure. Because uh, the B field, you see, this is the B field, yes? It's not Poissonian. However, if you multiply it by GM, K, GM, L, there is something that potentially is Poissonian because so this is anti-symmetric and then uh, you take the matrix so in the alpha prime going to zero this thing g go where i think they go to zero right yeah so this thing go to zero and if you have and if you have keep the calbramon field constant you will get zero. However, if you turn this thing where to infinity, such that this product is going to some that I call P K L, you can have uh, anti-symmetric. You, you can have finite by vector. So this is going to zero. This is going to infinity. You you are taking this limit. You will get. Uh, the non-commutative product on the boundary. And this is described. So the, uh, this was discovered by uh, Korn and Schwartz and uh, is also described in the paper of Edward Witten. Okay. Is Edward Witten? 2000. When they studied this limit, a non-commutative theory coming out of it. So, but here, if you don't take the limit, you also have Moyle product, right? Uh, you see, if you don't have the limit, uh, before you take the limit, you have a kind of correlator that depends, that depends on Z. And uh, nobody knows, and it's a question, nobody knows uh, what is the proper algebraic structure that, that is described by this? That's why you see, I put you this thing here, and it's kind of important that this depends on Z. So people know that there is associativity here for uh, given M, but this is a, something infinite dimensional depending on Z and you have Z everywhere. When you, when you do OPE, you have Zs and the equations are complicated and it is hard to find algebraic structure behind it. Um, why is it not just the vertex algebra? What's uh... No, it, it's not bad that it's a vertex algebra, but you need to answer the question, what is the vertex algebra in general? If you say it is a vertex algebra and you do not uh, explain uh, what it is. So uh, what kind of explanation you want? Ah, what kind of explanation? Uh, could you say classify? Okay. The question is how to study bootstrap equations. So but actually what people call vertex operator algebra is just you have this equation. So what do we have? We have some examples, okay? But we need uh, the complete, uh, not, not classification, but we need a general point of view on how to work with them. Um, these, these things are very unconvenient, unconventional from the point of view of say, algebraic geometry, yes? I mean, uh, okay, for, uh, two comments. First of all, that the subject of vertex algebra is perfectly mathematical and like people of are working. Course. Yeah, of but course. then uh, the bootstrap yeah. equation would not involve just Z, but also Z bar. That's of why. Course. 
Oh, of course, of course, here, here. Let me put here. I, I agree. I agree to start data this way. And then it is more than not just a vertex algebra, that's true. Oh, you, it's a question. You may call this vertex algebra too. But uh, if you put Z, I, I will agree on Z too. The question is, uh, is it possible to uh, to put it, to relate it with the classical uh, uh, stuff in mathematics? Of course, it's a mathematical object. But the, the point is that uh, it is hard to relate it to something simpler. Namely, the question is how to think about this. So we know how to think about associative project product. We know to we know how to think about product where something is finite, finite dimensional or finitely generated. So the full stuff of algebraic geometry is about this structure. But when you write it this way, you may ask, what is this? It is not going so in this way, it is not going to anything uh, that is simpler than this. Of course, it's a mathematical subject. I just want to say that there are mathematical problems where you a priori have no good approaches to. Yes, you may write bootstrap equation for the Z bar. You may write bootstrap equation for Z. Then what to do with it? You see, when you write down say associativity and commutativity, you have a ring, you say now ring is finitely generated and you have relations and you start to get a lot of examples and this is called the algebraic geometry, okay? So if ring is finitely generated, then, you, then it's either polynomials or polynomials with polynomial relations. Ah, this is algebraic geometry. What can we say about this? structure. It's a mathematical equation without a good uh, tool uh, to understand it from some other perspective. So then what I what I'm trying to explain to you is that this is very complicated thing. We don't know how to understand it. So we can try to understand its asymptotics, okay? So if we have something that complicated, then we can look at the critical points here and understand something as the critical points. And as the critical points, we have, and I am trying to say, what do we have as a critical point? Because up to now, what people are doing, they're considering random examples, okay? In particular, when you say that you have an example, you need, in this way, you need to produce this C alpha beta gamma give a formula. Hmm? So people have very complicated formulas for rational conformal field theories, you see. Of course, it's an interesting question. It's just not clear how to, how to study it. Okay, so this is this bootstrap problem. And, uh, 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 and there are asymptotics, okay? And uh, what I just said is that studying this vertex, okay, let me let me call this vertex algebra, okay. No, no, no so, sorry, I, if, I mean, if it has Z bar, if it has fractional powers of Z, then no need to call it like that, I'm just. Uh, okay, okay, okay. So this, so this is a bootstrap problem. Let us erase it. Let us study this. So uh, the question is, of course, what can we say about uh, this object?
So what I'm going to, to discuss would be some class of representations of this, okay? I just wanted to show that there is a, a, an issue, a problem. And if I have only this, if I have only these here, I would definitely miss interesting objects, you see? Because, uh, because uh, in the example that I mentioned, in two examples that I mentioned, the fields, okay, in, okay, in WZW, you might say that it's the same example. It's WZW, that depends on K, yes? The fields uh, that become uh, elements of the commutative ring are not chiral. So by the way, this chiral or not chiral would be a subject of what I'm going to tell you, okay? If I study only, so my, I would like to say that if, if I study non-chiral things, I could see the metric, okay? And I told you how to see the metric, but here we need to study non-chiral things. Because once again, so it's easy, yes? You have Z k1 k2 over r squared, non-chiral. But you need to include these fields to see to see the ring. These are not chiral. Well, that's why when people say, let us forget about the bar here, consider only holomorphic. It's interesting, but it's not all. Okay. And you are correct about if you if we have z, we should have only integer powers of z, right? And we call this chiral algebra. Yes, yes. But here we we definitely have structure like this. And uh, if you have integer power like m, it could not go to zero, okay? You cannot be one, 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 and then zero. So it's another structure. And I am uh, putting your attention to this structure. Okay. And I am telling you that, that I put here the bar. And when I put here the bar, I get these fields and I get, uh, and I get in the bulk, something commutative associative and I get on the boundary associative but not commutative and this is some kind of the limiting structure of this complicated story. So like two years ago I was uh, referring a research statement of the 79th descendant of Confucius. Okay. So you, you have heard about Confucius, yes? So yeah. actually Confucius means three, uh, three words, Kong Fu Tsi. So I was referring uh, Mr. Kong and Kong is just the same family name. And he is a direct uh, descendant of Confucius, actually 79th descendant, okay? And in his research statement, he said that this OP is what would replace algebraic geometry and some, uh, something and something. But he was not quite clear about it. It is kind of a research pro project, okay? In which sense, this ZZ bar dependence uh, is uh, a new algebraic geometry? It was not clear, 
Okay, so he was planning to work on it. So he works at Harvard and then now he returned to China. Okay, so it is an interesting open question. Okay, so summarizing, I'm telling you that the Polyakov approach is that you have conformal field theory. And this is kind of the generalized geometry. Depending on parameter M. And uh, we get ordinary geometry as a critical point, MC. And, uh, and here we have a ring. And uh, that, that's how we see the metric. OK? By the way, OK. Uh, so in this way, what we call gravity, what is the gravity? Gravity is a metric on the space. However, both space and metric are emerging, emerging of this structure. Should we make a short break before we yeah, start talking yeah, about gravity? Because, because now, now I, I hope that I put these ideas in your mind. Okay, and then we'll come to yes, we'll make a short break, and then we'll come to something more definite. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Okay, then I'm gonna pause the video for now. Okay, so after these preliminary remarks on the general structure, I would not be that ambitious to discuss it for all ends. Okay, I still I'd like to understand in some detail what would happen near M critical. Okay. But what I know from this discussion, what is my philosophy? My philosophy is that, of course, we are not getting the smooth manifold in the limit. We actually have commutative associative algebra. Okay, so it would mean that the result should be a fine scheme rather than a smooth manifold. Okay? And these things are very different. <clears throat> I wonder if one can think of more general schemes in this case. Uh, you see, maybe maybe more general schemes. And at least I know I know some examples. Okay? So when I say, so I would say point number one, a fine scheme. And uh, then I would say a fine super scheme with homological vector field. And I have, I am going this way. And then there is a point number three. And here I need to quote Lurier, you know, another very respectful man who got, I think he got uh, Fields Prize, not Edel Prize. But he says that these super schemes with homological vector field is nothing but, he said that this is derived algebraic geometry for engineers. So in this, so he, he gave a colloquium explaining what derived algebraic geometry is. Actually, I just looked it up. He doesn't have fields. What? Um, 
He doesn't right. have fields. Well, oh, yes, but this is the level of fields. So yes, yes. <laughs> so okay, it's called black fields medal. You know, you know, like you have sh shadow billionaires. You know, there are billionaires and shadow billionaires. You see, some someone who are equivalent to fields medal, but not fields medal. Like Nikita Nikrasov, you know, he is like having a fields medal, but he has no fields medal. Okay, so Luria is <laughs> of the same type. Okay, so he, he gave a colloquium saying that this thing is derived algebraic geometry for engineers. Okay, so there are mathematicians and there are engineers, so down to earth people. Who can understand it only in this way? So first I thought that he is insulting me, okay? But uh, then I decided, okay, after all, in my diploma it's written that I'm an engineer. Okay, let me be engineer. So I understand this, then I'll understand uh, derived algebraic geometry in the sense of Lourier. But it, in any case, it means that I'm moving in the right direction, okay? So I understand it as an engineer, and uh, maybe later I understand it as a this as a field mathematician. Okay. Somebody who is much more smarter than me could understand it in terms of the right algebraic geometry. I am not ready. Okay. <coughs> but still. Still, I'm going in this direction. So it means that the magic geometry should be a scheme. Something like this. Uh, excuse me, can I ask a very basic question? Uh, are you talking somewhere in the lectures about schemes, what it is? No, I'm not talking about schemes, what it is, because uh, I consider it as a, as a standard piece of knowledge. So, so schemes, uh, so affine schemes are the objects that is dual in the algebra geometric correspondence to a commutative associative ring. And uh, you can replace what commutative to super commutative, and uh, you can put here homological vector field in it. No, I'm not <laughs> explaining this. It's, uh, I thought it's a standard piece of knowledge. So, okay. but, 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 if, but, but if you ask, okay, if you ask, sorry, I, I'll explain it briefly, okay? Mm. So, in order, in ordinary geometry, we have a manifold, we have points, And we have uh, sub manifolds. Now, <coughs> we have the following objects smooth functions. So it's called C infinity on X. Smooth functions. These smooth functions form a ring. Then, <coughs> for each figure, you have an idea of this ring that are functions vanishing. On a figure. So, what is the figure? Some manifold. And if figure F1 is inside figure F2, then ideal corresponding to figure F1 
is. So ideal corresponding to figure F2 is inside the ideal corresponding to figure F1. We call this contravariant factor. So figures could lie inside each other and these ideals go the opposite way. Actually, if, if you vanish on on F2 and F1 is inside of F2, then you definitely vanish on F1, right? It implies, it means this inclusion, okay? Okay. So <clears throat> then basically that's it. You have a ring and then you have, uh, so, here it has, so it means that if you consider ring and its ideals with the inclusion, you see sometimes ideal are inside ideal, okay? So there is, and you may call order of ideals. Mm -hmm. You have this structure and uh, you may understand this. You may understand the ring as something like functions on some manifold and ideals as, uh, as corresponding to figures. So we have uh, figures and inclusions of figures. So of course, inside the figure F1, maybe there is a point. So you, can, you cannot you cannot you cannot divide the point. So here you have so point is a smaller figure, smaller figure is a point. So point corresponds to maximal idea. So maximal idea means that you cannot do, put it inside anything else. But that's it. So scheme is uh, the replacement of the manifold with figures in it by a ring with ideals in it. And uh, this uh, and this interpretation. And there are many examples of, of how can you uh, realize it. And uh, actually, in algebraic geometry, you are not studying a ring of smooth functions. Here, you typically study rings, uh, algebraic rings, something like rings of polynomials. Okay? Mm -hmm. And you take uh, cosets of this ring. And what you will get here is algebraic geometry. So if rings are rings of polynomials, you may say that uh, I think they are called Northern ring. So there is no sort of property. It means that they are finitely generated. So if they are finitely generated, it means that uh, that uh, they come from polynomials of x1, xn, and here we have some relations. And of course, these relations are polynomial relations. And in this way, you are calling about algebraic geometry. So, so it is basically the philosophy. And uh, geometry that to respond to the ring and set of ideals is called uh, a scheme. Mm -hmm. wow. Okay, thank you. So, uh, so simplest example, I hope I am short, is to consider the space of polynomial. It's a ring. Kind of ideals do we have here? There is an ideal that is that is made by polynomials times x minus a. So this is the maximal idea. It corresponds to a point a in the complex plane. But of course, there are not maximal ideas.
of this idea is uh, smaller than this idea. Okay? Smaller. Because we just say that this polynomial is divisible by x minus b. So it corresponds to the pair of two points, a and b. Now, so maybe it's not, maybe it's reasonable to recall this. Now, what would happen if here I take b going to a? I will have another ideal, p of x, x minus a squared, okay? So it's a nice idea. And it corresponds to so so-called double point. Okay? Now, <clears throat> now what's interesting? That if you have a ring, and if you have an idea, okay, you may do the following thing. You may close on the ring of, by the idea, and you will get RE, ring associated to idea. So it is the space itself. So it is a so here we see in this picture. Uh, this is a space itself and it has figures in it. So in the example, here we see the space consisting of two points and the ring that is polynomial over the ideal generated by this element <coughs> is actually a C squared as a vector space. With very easy multiplication table, EA, EA is EA, EB, EB is EB, EA, EB, equals to zero. You may check that here you can take this basis. So functions that equal one at A and zero on B. If you have a double point, you may take A equals to zero. People mostly call it C of X divided by ideal generated by X squared. So this is an ideal. This ideal is called the principal ideal. I think Glavne is principal. I don't remember the English terminology. Uh, so everything proportional to X squared. So this ring is very special. It consists of x1, and multiplication table is like this. This is called double numbers. Two-dimensional ring with this multiplication table. This multiplication table is different from this. So double point. And two distinct points are different, okay? <coughs> <coughs> but double point comes from the two distinct points when you change parameters. So gross index idea was to consider this and this on equal footing. So double point is something that is not a manifold at all, okay? 
but it is still described in this language. So double point is an example of the zero dimensional scheme. When I say that it's a scheme, uh, I, you see, it has an interesting ring, but it's not a, a ring of uh, smooth or algebraic functions on anything. It is just this ring. The way to view it is uh, from this ring structure. So actually people sometimes call it double number. People call it also actual infinitesimal. Because X is so small that when you square it, it's zero, okay? So you can make analysis based on double numbers, okay? Because you have infinitesimal something, not as a limit of a sequence, but uh, like this. So this is very short, very brief description of the schemes, but I decided to explain it because I will use it later on. So if I, if I have here M, I have uh, not double, but n ample point. And uh, these things actually have moduli. You can deform it. And there are many zero dimensional schemes that have interesting moduli. So the simple example of, uh, uh, of uh, zero dimensional schemes that have moduli, okay. Let me give uh, you a commercial example, okay. When I say commercial, I just want to say that if, so would I sell this stuff? I would sell it like this, okay. I will sell it like, like this. Consider the ring of polynomials, okay? Mm. No, not like this. But still I will sell it. Wait a moment. And here I'll consider ideal generated by partial derivative of function f, where f is a general quintic. Just that I described to the beginning, x1 to the five plus, plus x5 to the five plus a x1, x5 plus something like this. I have a function. I can consider the ideal generated by its partial derivatives. So this is called Jacobian ring. Okay. And this ring is still finite dimensional for general quintic. So it's a finite dimensional ring. However, this ring definitely keeps information about the moduli of the quintic. So the moduli of this structure is as rich, at least, as the moduli space of quintic. That is very famous 
as the most uh, sim as the simplest Kalabiyao uh, that has a mirror and all that stuff. However, this is finite dimensional. So, this example shows that zero dimensional scheme, it is a zero dimensional scheme, can have very interesting moduli, can have very interesting structure, still being zero dimensional. So, so here we are coming to philosophical question. What we are looking for? So either we are looking for uh, infinite dimensional rings, like rings of smooth functions, or we are looking for structures. So when we are looking for structures, in order to see the structure, we don't need infinite dimensional space of function. It's enough to study zero dimensional. Zero dimensional schemes that corresponding to rings with interesting moduli. Huh? Because as people know in string theory compactification, it's not the compact manifold that we are looking for. We are looking for its moduli space because we can observe actually its moduli space and not uh, the manifold itself. Okay, so here I finish the philosophical remark about Grothendieck schemes, about uh, why it's important, why they are rich. So there is Grothendieck schemes. There, is, there are zero dimensional schemes that are very interesting subclass in the space of Grothendieck schemes. And main issue is that they have a lot of moduli and uh, they are finite dimensional as a vector space. Hmm? Excuse me, I have also the question. Yes, of course. Uh, can we write schemes in a tropical geometry terms? Yes. Open. Yes. We can write schemes in the tropical geometry. Uh, uh, so the simplest scheme, the simplest scheme is in ordinary geometry is x, y equals zero. Let me write ordinary scheme. Oh, no, we need to understand that it is that this is not okay. This is an affine scheme. It is not a manifold. <clears throat> so when I was a second year uh, student, uh, I tried to study differential geometry, and on differential geometry, they told me that the manifold is something that looks like a disk locally. Nobody told me that. I can study this simple uh, equation, x, y equal to zero. It's a nice manifold, but this manifold is what? It's, uh, it, so it, it's, it's a nice equation. And here is the graph of this equation. It's not a manifold. The neighbor in the neighborhood of this point, it's not a disk. It's not an interval, it's something more complicated. So, so when I studied differential geometry, they told me, you should never study these objects. Okay, so they tell me, I say, okay, guys, okay, boomers, I will not study this object. However, later on, I realized that if I study two-dimensional quantum field theory in the Lorentz uh, space, then, then the main equation, line Gardon equation is this, p plus p minus equals to zero. So it's called massless particle.
and I see, okay, it's just equation x, y equals to zero. It appears in two-dimensional quantum field theory. Why should I exclude it uh, from my consideration? So I realized that they cheated, yes? They cheated, they were not doing these things properly. If equation like this, manifold like this, appears in mathematical physics, it has to be studied. Yes, it's not a manifold in the differential geometrical sense, but it means that uh, the sense is uh, outdated, not correct, whatever, you see? So, uh, when I was in uh, the second year in the university, I was not uh, brave enough to attack them, you see? It took me like uh, 37 years, 38 years to say, ah, come on, guys. It was not my misunderstanding. You cheated me. You told me that everything should look like a disk. It's wrong. Your demand is wrong. You studied the wrong object. I have to include all this. This comes uh, in uh, quantum field theory. Then, then I realized that they cheated me not only in quantum field theory. They cheated me, I'm sorry, I'll come to the tropical issue. They cheated me also in mechanics. So I can open the volume of uh, Landau and Lipschitz, okay? So it's a Russian textbook. And they told me, we are studying the system with constraints. So system with constraints mean that I have some function and this function equals to zero. And uh, I don't see what is wrong with this function. You can take any function. There, are, there is no physical restriction. Look, this is, a, this is a potential, okay? If I do it on the configuration space, this is the potential. Why should I demand that, this, that zeros of the potential should be only like this and not like this? So what is wrong in such potential? There is nothing wrong in such potential. So why people demand this differential geometry stuff? Why are they doing this wrong definition of uh, the manifold? Only now I realize that they were cheating. Then people told me what happened with Bourbaki. Have you heard about Bourbaki? Okay. I think you had. So Bourbaki uh, decoupled. Do you know when they decoupled? So they wrote like 10 books and then they stopped. They actually stopped when they came to the issue of manifolds. And they wanted to write something about smooth manifolds. And then Grossendick said, it's not easy. And the others say, why it's not easy? Everybody knows it. Okay, not everybody in the 60s, late 50s, early 60s. He said, no, we should, we should not do it this way. And he came with a plan. That's what we should study. And this should be proper differential geometry. And you know what? Other people of Bourbaki disagree with his plan. And it was the end of Bourbaki. Okay? So, it is an interesting and subtle issue. I insist on schemes. Now, now when we come to the question about tropicalization, of course we have schemes. The, the difference is that equations are not algebraic, but tropical algebraic. That means piecewise linear. 
And of course, we have all this phenomenon. So I, I told you that, that this is how we write down linear function and the entropical uh, world. And this is how we write down quadratic function. So if it has uh, uh, common uh, zeros, common zeros, these two lines go together into a single line with the integer vector that is multiple of two. And this is uh, the, <clears throat> how to say it? It is a root, no, not a simple root. I have two comments. Yes. Well, first, in, in differential geometry, you study smooth manifold, smooth functions, and then these objects are just not part of that world. And that's perfectly fine. Nobody cheated you. They played by the rules of the game that they've set. Yes, they cheated me uh, in taking the. So I don't like these rules. Okay. And the, oh. and, and the second comment I want is that we actually run out of time. So can you yes. get to the. Yes. Yes. So I'll be very short. Okay. You see, I'm trying to answer questions. So I'll be very short, <clears throat> saying that now Now I'm going to start. So let me start with a scheme with, with the commutative associative ring. Okay. And, uh, and I will define correlators of some fields that I call phi. And uh, and if I have these fields, and only these fields, I will define this correlator to be what? To be the product. Okay, you may ask, what, what do I mean? What do I mean being a product? Being a product, I mean the following. Not I will not, I will call it I1, I n. So, uh, so I'll study sphere. So I have n incoming points. And say one outgoing. So I will study the following object. Let me put phi tilde at, at our outgoing outgoing point. So this, so I study this correlator. So it's actually an operation. And here, this correlator will be just this correlator would be just uh, the product. So this correlation is Z independent product. I can define this and here I don't see any structure, just ring structure. <clears throat> I, I would like to do the following. I would like to go from M critical, okay? <clears throat> so in order to go from M critical, I need to introduce another type of field. Let me call it there. So there is derivation of a ring. So elements here. So how should I denote elements? Let me denote it traditional, 
way I call them V. Because in the smooth case, these are vector fields. Okay? But they are the der derivations of the ring. It means that I have an operation. V times phi, C A I J, phi J. Okay? Maybe I should call it with another letter. So C, C was here. So how, how should I call it? I will call it D, okay? So it, so it has two inputs, derivation, uh, function, and the function, okay? And I have a condition that D der derives C, okay? I have C, of course. So phi i, phi j, is C I J K phi K. So uh, condition is that V applied. So I call it V K, V phi. So it's uh, operation that has two inputs, one output. A I J, okay. So they're different. So let me call it, call it with a double line. So, so V phi one phi two is phi phi one multiplied by phi two plus phi one times V multiplied by phi two. Okay? So it's, uh, this means that, that I have a derivation. Okay? <clears throat> now, <clears throat> let me put here the derivation operators. Okay? So let me define them inductively. So V and many phi's and phi star. Here I have Z. Uh, okay, here I have W. Here I have Z1, Zn. So how to define this correlator? So this correlator is defined by saying that it has a pole. It goes as one over W minus Z1. Okay, and here I have this V of phi at Z1 and the rest. So it is so I defined it by this singularity. And, uh, and this defines correlators of one V. So similarly, I can define correlator of several Vs. So here, suppose I have V1, a W1, V2, a W2. So it has singularities when W2 is going to the i, w1 going to the i, and it also has singularities on w1 is going to w2. And here the singularity is v1, v2, commutator. So if I have uh, derivations, I can take commutators. So now the claim is that if I have a ring and its derivations, this determine me, this uniquely determine me the correlator. So this is the definition of correlators on the sphere. Okay. 
Now, I need to check consistency. Because uh, I have kind of recursive relation. What happens if I add more Vs? Do I actually have function with such properties? So you may check that uh, these things are consistent. Okay. So of course these Vs form a structure of Lie algebra. Okay. But it follows from the fact that they are derivations. Okay, good. I have this theory. <laughs> At the moment, I would say that I have a space with no gravity, right? No gravity. Now, so I have this for the ring. Associated to the scheme Y. Okay. In order to put gravity in, I will do the following thing. I consider the right moving theory corresponding to ring Y tilde. Here, everything is the same, but anti-holomorphic. And with tildes. Okay? I do exactly the same construction. Then, <coughs> then I just tend the product, these two theories. Okay? So I defined, I will define new fields, F total, that are sums of phi, phi tilde, A, A, okay? So fields, new fields are tensor products of these fields. So F dot belongs to what? Belongs to what? It belongs to tensor product. How to how should I call it? Ring Y tensor ring Y tilde over C and uh, and uh, this is tensor product not not as rings but as what as vector spaces. So now, now let me take the space that let me call it E G. Okay. Do you know why I call it E G? Okay. I call it E G because it stands for easy geometry. So what is EG? Dare Y tensor dare Y tilde as a vector space. Okay. Okay, so elements here, you know how I call them? I'll call them E gamma. E because it's easy, gamma stands for geometry. Just elements of this space. So the claim is that, that I have defined e, e G1 at Z1. Okay, I call them W. E gamma 
K and WK. And here I have F one at Z one, FL at ZL. So this correlator is not holomorphic. So this is uh, so this correlator is what? It is smooth. Oh, okay. So it is just analytic. Because it depends on Z and Z bar. Okay. So the claim is that this is already a good uh, quantum field theory. Uh, I'm sorry, here I need to put here the output F dual. You see, I hope that you are not be surprised when I put here dual things, uh, because if you studied the geometric quantization of Kansevich, you know that it's possible to do it like this. So at one point you can put the dual field. Moreover, statement that these correlators are pretty well defined. Okay. And these correlators are what? They are rational functions. On. So K and L. On C, P. K plus L. You see it's number of insertions times CP K plus L. You may ask why I have the product because I'll take Z1 or, or W1 as coordinates of here. Okay. Uh, sorry. Ah, I made it wrong. I made it wrong. I'm sorry. CP1, not, not, not this, to the power K plus L times CP1 to the power K plus L, actually plus one. I need the out, outgoing point. So Z I are coordinates here. And Z I bars are coordinates here. Okay, so it's exactly the trick that uh, Edward Witten instructs us to do. He says that we, if we have holomorphic, if we have a function that depends on ZZ bar, it's better to consider it as a rational function on such space. It means that when, we, when, I, when I have something like Z1 minus Z2, moduli square, okay? I do not consider it as a smooth function on uh, CP, so it's not a smooth function on CP1 times CP1. Hmm? As you may think, of course, minus diagonal, but a rational function CP1 times CP1 times CP1 <laughs> times CP1 minus diagonal. Here I don't even need to say diagonal because when I say rational, it implies this. So what is this function? 1 over Z1 minus Z2, 1 over Z1 bar minus Z2 bar. So it's a rational function of four arguments, okay? It's rational, not integer, because it has poles, okay? So
So, the, so this is what correlators are. And here, Kohler's remark is very important because Kohler said, we need integer powers. Kohler, do you remember this? Hmm? Yes, yes. Integer powers. So forget about your uh, fractional things, right? That's what you said. Well, that's what you told. You are right. These things are just the uh, analysis. Now, <laughs> now actually, these guys have dimension one one. And I can consider them, consider them as deformations. So what I would like to do, I would like to integrate over omegas and have a deformed theorem. So then the question. Would it be conformal? Mm -hmm. And uh, and the answer is there are obstructions for this theory to be conformal. Obstruction is. E gamma one, E gamma. Okay, so when I when I would like to treat it as a deformation, I have the same the same E gamma, so it is a deformation now. So I would like to do this integral. So it is just E gamma integrated over sigma. And here I have these Fs. So it is, actually it is not conformal in general. And let me tell you how it is how it is not conformal so abstraction i have an abstraction and this abstraction is one of a z minus w moduli squared pole here and abstraction is e gamma E gamma double bracket. So the claim is this is the beta function. But actually, this is only first abstraction. So I will have higher abstractions here. Okay, so now since Kohler told us that we are short in time, okay? I wanted to come to this point. You should ask me why I'm putting here E gamma, saying that I'm studying the easy version. So what is not the easy version? Huh? Why, I am, why I am talking only about easy version, okay? Good question, right? Okay, let me des describe what is not an easy version. But complete version. Complete version is, is goes as follows. 
if you if you have y, you have not only v, you also have another object that that I called d phi. So how to define correlators of v and also d phi's? In a simple way, we take correlators of v's and phi's, and you just take derivative. Okay. So I observe that d phi has conformal dimension that is also one like v like derivatives so would i be more accurate in writing correlators i should say that not just v of z phi of w go like z minus w v phi actually i need to put here dz okay so correlator of uh, derivations of vector fields it's a one form okay here we have here we also have this one form now Now, what are these d phi's? So I have d phi's and I also have phi's. So these guys are one forms on the scheme. Okay. So actually, what actually I cheated you just a bit because I'm a bit in the hurry, and uh, so actually one form on a scheme is a formal object of the type phi d phi so some functions times d of some other function okay so it is a space of pairs phi d phi okay when you when you understand that uh, okay it's clear it's just a space of pairs and you have also equivalence equivalence means the d of phi one phi two equals to phi two d phi one plus phi one d phi two. So in the space of these guys, you have this relation. So you can either consider pairs with these relations. Okay, so I'm just telling you how, how differential forms are defined. So I call this omega one. Now, now what I what I just like to say is that uh, here, here I can put uh, any element of omega one. I just take this representative and put it like this. So all one forms are made out of such objects. And to this object, I correspond this object. And I know how to compute these correlators. Now, statement.
statement is that derivatives together with one forms form a Lie algebra. So here we have derivatives, here we have one forms, what derivatives act on one forms, etc. And that I call L gamma. So it means left geometry. Okay? Left. And now I will leave the world of easy geometries to the world of geometries. Okay? So I said easy geometries. So now let me consider geometries. Geom. So what is geom? Geom is the following space. I'm sorry. Uh, maybe I'm going to make you a host so you can finish uh, because I need to go actually. Okay. So, so okay. Uh, no, so let, 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 let us finish at this moment. No, but you probably want to finish the no, story. No, I, I want, uh, uh, okay. I, I'd like to continue later. Okay, so uh, uh, we, we have spent uh, uh, the time, okay? So, so let us finish right now, okay? Mm. Oh, are you sure? Because then probably you would never finish this story because but you will forget about it by the next week. No, I will not forget about this. Okay. The... You see, so because uh, I actually covered I properly covered one half of the story. There was an interesting second half. Okay. I just miscalculated the time, you see? And I promise that I will finish the story next week. Okay? Okay. And I'm ending the recording. Mm-hmm.